Recording in progress.
Good afternoon and welcome to a slightly too loud <laughs> NW Business School Open Day. We are very excited to see all of you today. And also, um, since I've been uh, doing some M uh, MBA interviews for quite some time um, this year so long, it is really awesome to see some of our MBA students that were already admitted into the program as well. Welcome to everyone joining us online, whether it be Zoom or YouTube Live. Thank you for joining us. We are really excited today to share with you what we have been developing over many, many years here at the Northwest University Business School. And we hope that you can continue this legacy with us. This morning, I do not plan on keeping you busy with speeches and presentations for too long. But there are very many questions that some of you have and have been asking, and therefore we decided to host this open day to answer your questions, especially those of you that are still wondering whether or not you should actually be um, applying to enter into our programs. So today we will give you a brief overview of the business school itself. And again, we won't focus on everything. There's very nice videos, and afterwards you will receive a data pack with some YouTube links to all of our relevant programs, videos, um, content. Uh, some of the most um, referenced materials we've included into the booklets that you can get next door as well, just for your reference again. And some time during the morning, I will actually refer to some of the, the content in there as well. But you will receive a lot of information after this. But the main idea today is whether you're online or you're in person, if you have a question, you shouldn't leave today without having that question answered. Okay, so that's the main aim. And um, if the, on, the question is whether you should join the NWU Business School, the answer is always yes. Okay, so just in case you were wondering. So I'll be giving you a brief intro into the business school itself. On behalf of our acting chief director, Prof. Annette Smith, who is currently in a meeting, but she will be joining us for the networking session afterwards. Then Ms. Lungi, uh, oh, Dr. Lungi, she became a doctor this week, so we need to celebrate that again, uh, will um, give us an overview of accreditations and specifically why it is important to care about accreditations. Um, it, accreditations comes with a premium, so you have to have to appreciate why it is important to look out for that when you consider business schools. Then I will give you an overview of the MBA program. Yuan will give you an overview of the postgraduate diploma in management. Uh, Joseph will give you an overview of our PhD program and some of the research that we are doing within the school. And then Mornay will give you an overview of our executive education offerings that are typically not these long formal programs, but shorter snippets of very nice information that will equip you to do your job better. And after that, we will have a general Q&A. But once I get to the end of the MBA and you still have questions about the MBA and you have a pressing question, you are allowed to ask it. Um, the online people, I maybe will not be answering your questions as well during the presentation, but if you are in the crowd and you want to ask a question, please do. Um, and then we will have some general Q&As and also fielding all of the questions that were submitted online on YouTube and Zoom um, as soon as we get to the end of our info session. So in all of our video content, all of our print media, you would see that our mission is also also our tagline, shaping executive minds in Africa. And that is something that we try and live through everything that we do. So through our vision and our values, we, when we enter into a classroom, when we decide whether or not to investigate a specific problem, or when we engage with our students, we embody these values. And we want to showcase that, um, let me just make this smaller, then all of you can see online there as well, um, is that firstly, 
our most important value is that we um, want to embody this excellence in our core uh, business. And we want to ensure academic integrity. Later on today, you will also hear about our unit for corruption and integrity studies. Briefly, when the, the um, short courses that they present are being um, showcased. But the reason why this is so important is, especially in South Africa or in Africa, where corruption is a very big problem, it is something that we as a business school would like to tackle and that we would like to be actively um, taking part in being part of the solution. Therefore, also, we focus on ethical behavior and good governance, the Bortu or Ubuntu building communities principle, and then the notion of social justice. We are also fully committed to sustainable development. And that's also something that is becoming increasingly important um, for corporates out there, but also for us as academic institutions to uh, commit to these 17 international goals that all of us should be working together towards to, um, to solve. And we have identified eight specific areas in which we are committed to make that difference. And we do this through a number of other initiatives. So apart from the fact that we cover that in some of our academic content, hello Iggy, please join us for a, an MBA session. <laughs> okay, will you become an MBA student? Great, okay. I hope you um, adhere to the admission requirements. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> Apart from the fact that we have um, our formal academic programs that will be showcased today, you will also be added to our mailing list receiving the information about the um, credible thought leadership that we aim to present through programs like, like our PITSOs, our think tanks, and also our African Bon Bonds Initiative. So that is some of the areas in which we showcase that we as academics within the business school also engage with business leaders in Africa and showcase what thought leadership already exists within um, our community and within our, um, our country. And then we showcase it around topical issues um, throughout the year. We are also ensuring that we have engaged teaching and learning. So when we go to the classroom, we don't want to just focus on theoretical issues and teach you whatever has been written into some form of a, um, a textbook. We hope to show you how this actually impacts the community. And that is also then again linked to our sustainable development goals. We also have a plethora of community engagement projects, one of which is actually something that you will become part of as part of our um, MBA program, when you work in a group context to work on your company project, you will be delivering um, consulting services to a specific company. And um, I've, been recent, I've recently been part of that um, examination process and especially hearing from the prominent people in industry that are the sponsors or the hosts of these company projects to hear how much value they get and that they assigned to having these students um, really studying their company and um, coming up with valuable insights and, uh, and, and pointers in terms of their strategy is really something that I think I undervalued in the past. And then, of course, we have um, some outreaches uh, with typical small and medium um, enterprises, and then we perform some um, engaged research as well. So in every study there's a research component and that research component is um, on a topic that is um, uh, application based it's not highly theoretical it is really applied to whatever business you are in and um, therefore we do in, uh, perform engaged research so to focus specifically on the accreditations i thought that i would ask our senior manager for quality and accreditations to specifically speak um, from her experience as the person that is responsible for getting us through all of the hoops that is associated with accreditation. She, um, 
will be able to, to do it much better than I am. And hopefully she won't get um, tangled into this. So, Lungi. This way around. Yeah, sorry. Is it fine like this? Okay. It'll be fine. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to see you all here and to see that people are eager to meet and to interact with each other. We are looking forward to have you as our students here. We hope you being here will lead to you enrolling for your studies with us. So I'm the Senior Manager for Quality and Accreditation. So I'm just gonna talk to you briefly about uh, quality and accreditation, what it means to us as a business school and what is it that we're benefiting from it. So for us, quality is more about everything that we do. It's embedded in all our activities. From the time that you made your first inquiry with us, there are some quality control measures in, in place. The time that you go through your, if you're an MBA uh, candidate right now, you realize that there are certain steps that you need to follow and comply with in order to be admitted into your specific program. Uh, apologies, there's a rent out there. My name is Sulungi Lensizwane. <laughs> okay, so being the, a, a business school and as a, an, a, a unit within a parent institution being Northwest University, we are expected to comply with uh, certain regulations. We also need to prove that we are evolving as a business school. So in a business school language, you cannot separate quality from accreditation because uh, accreditation is a golden thread of quality. There's no way you can talk about one, uh, one and not uh, include uh, another one. So quality is there in all our activities. You will see as you go through your journey with us, uh, in your registration, the way you attend your courses, there are quality measures involved in all those. There are policies that you need to comply with up to a point where you graduate and you become our alumni. And then also quality is in the stuff that we use here in the business school. We have a, a great pool of qualified uh, uh, lecturers that we use here. So it also goes down to the curriculum that we're going to deliver to you as our student. We promise to give you the best quality that we can possibly offer to you. And then we admit that you chose our programs. I'm sure there is something that you saw in us that pushed you to come and enroll with us because there are so many business schools in our country and internationally. But you specifically chose Northwest University. And then we're going to make sure that the, your investment, because you'll be investing your time, you'll be investing your money. So we're going to make sure that you get the best uh, return on your investment by giving you the best high quality education that we can uh, give you. So when we talk about uh, quality and accreditations, uh, we've got uh, national accreditations and international accreditations. So on a national level, being an institution of higher education learning, we've got what we call the, like, you know, the Department of Higher Education. We comply with its policies, regulations, and everything that they require to, from us. And then there's also your CHE, which is the Council for Higher Education that we are com fully compliant with. All our programs are registered with those bodies. There's also your SACWA, your HUQF, and HUQC. So we are all part of those uh, processes of accreditation. So on a national level, we are fully accredited, meaning we are fully compliant with all our national regulation regarding higher education, teaching, and learning, and research and other activities that I can mention at this point. And then we also have accreditations at an international level. So when we talk from the business school language, uh, there is a term that we use as a triple crown accreditation. So if you look at this um, diagram, this is our strategy. We call it the project proton. So you can see here we have the AMBA. So when you talk about the triple crown accreditation, we are referring to the AMBA, which is the Association of MBAs. And then we are also talking about EQUIS, which is the European Foundation of Management Development Quality Improvement Systems. And we're also talking about the ASCSB, which is the Association to Advance a Collegiate Schools of Business. So if you are enrolled in a business school that is accredited by one of these uh, accrediting bodies, it means that business school 
it's very competitive and it also provides high quality standard of education. So be rest assured that you are not at the wrong place. We are going to do the best that we can to make sure that you enjoy. And by the time you, be, you come out of this institution, you will be a graduate of high quality as well. So when we talk more on, on accreditations, Mostly accreditations evaluate us based on different, uh, it can be criteria, standards, or principles. So it's quite a lengthy process to go through an accreditation process. And there is a lot of compliance that has to happen in terms of quality. So we use those accrediting bodies to improve our quality systems. And it's a continuous process. It never ends because they'll give you accreditation for five years. After five years, you need to have submitted uh, more reports uh, that also demonstrate that you are changing as an institution because we are living in the forever changing times. So one may ask a question, where do you fit in, in this whole process uh, as a potential student of Northwest University? Apart from international and national accrediting bodies, we also have our internal quality control systems in the university where we do our curriculum reviews, program reviews. Those who have been here for two years or so, they will see there are so many changes that happen every year. So we need to be adaptable as a business school. We also need to be agile. We need to, to, to demonstrate that we are resilient. We can stand the difficult time, just like we all experienced the COVID situation, but we all survived and we are still standing and no compromise was made in terms of quality. We tried our best to make sure that everything works very well. So as a student, you have, uh, we have a responsibility to deliver the best quality to you. But we also have an expectation from you as a student to be compliant of the rules and regulations and policies of this university. So you have a responsibility once you enroll with us, familiarize yourself with your academic environment and also what it entails. So I think I've said a mouthful. So I will end my talk here. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sitting here right now. We did it. This is maybe the most uncomfortable mic I've ever experienced. Okay, so that is accreditation. I hope that you now realize why it is important to look out for that. Um, now we will be focusing on those uh, programs that I referred to you, to you about. So if you stop by the stations next door and get yourself some um, goodie bag fillers in the process, please go and get yourself some very nice branded material. You will also see that we have compiled this booklet with all of the formal offerings of the business school, and it will be available for the entire day. So don't, don't rush to go and get it now. But everything that we are referring to from now on and a bit about the accreditation is all in here. So you will be able to reference to that afterwards. So apart from being your host today, I am also the um, program leader for the MBA program. And therefore, I will give you an overview of our specific MBA program. We refer to the MBA program as the flagship program because that is how it is perceived in industry as well, as a very favorable. Um, Goran, will you just admit um, our people in the waiting room, please? Um, it's seen, it is seen as not only our flagship program, but also the flagship of business training um, worldwide. We also see that uh, all, it used to be a three-year qualification. In 2015, the CHE specifically decided to um, change the qualification standard and then also decided to prescribe that it now becomes a two-year qualification. So while it is a two-year formal program, you have three years maximum to complete the program with us. 
in all of our teaching and learning, we endeavor to um, apply a blended teaching uh, methodology. So if you refer to the MBA specific booklet that I have created for you, you will see that um, I start off with a number of dates just to show to you what it means um, when we say that we follow a blended approach with our intake next year. So our business school specifically has a very good reputation on the face-to-face -face interactions that we create, the discussions that happens within, within that environment. And um, during the COVID pandemic, we saw that sort of a lot of that went lost if we couldn't spend time together. However, we also realized that the typical student that enrolls for an MBA is not someone that um, would like to go on a two-year sabbatical and um, spend a, as little time as possible on, in, on their work. It is typically the high performers that are excelling in their careers within industry with young or growing families. So we are cognizant of the fact that you are busy and that you can't necessarily take leave whenever you want or spend time away from home too much. Hence, you will see that um, there are two aspects or two, two categories of uh, contact time that we will be spending with you. This is a part-time qualification, but it is presented in contact mode and not in distance mode. The main difference between a blended approach with some online content as to a online um, program would be that online would be something like you would do on Coursera, where we have some information available online, you complete it at your own pace, you submit and you're done once you're done. Anyone can start at any time and um, it's not synchronized necessarily. In a um, blended approach like the one we are following, we will have some study schools. So one in at the end of January and one in July per year that we expect you to attend in person for the full duration of that week. So you will see that I also indicated to you how much leave you would do require to be there physically. So no simultaneous broadcasting. It might be recorded, but it is more for your reference afterwards. It's not supposed to be able to be replaced by just watching it online because the real value you gain from an MBA is that discussions that you have with your peers, um, engaging with them on the same problem that you and someone else is experiencing and learning from their experience and not just the lecturer presenting a lecture. All right, so we have those um, periods during which you need to be here. And then for eight Saturdays per semester, you will have um, online, but synchronous contact time. So you can attend that from wherever you are in the world. And um, we optimize that engagement with your lecturers and your peers through activities that are structured to allow, allow you to engage with others. The minimum requirements for those of you that are still wondering whether or not you um, qualify to enter into the MBA program, is firstly that you need an NQF level eight qualification. So that would typically be your four year professional degrees or an honors degree or a postgraduate diploma. And that's also why we present a postgraduate diploma ourselves as well for people that need that to bridge that gap between their undergraduate degree that maybe didn't end with an honors and um, the MBA program. Apart from that, um, paper process that we can do on our own. We also have all of our students write an admission test. And that's again, something that is universally used by business schools all over the world. And the aim of that test is to see whether you have the um, traits that is needed to be able to have a productive experience in class. So you would, apart from a score, that we, we use internally, that also generates a report for you that you can use for your personal development. So even if you're unsuccessful, you still get the report and the report will still help you 
to indicate areas in which you can develop yourself personally. So you get that after the admission test. And if um, you meet the threshold uh, score for that test, we also then invite you for a, an interview. And the interview, when I joined the business school, I was really curious about why would you need an interview as well? And then I started conducting these interviews and I, I, I was so energized by that process. I couldn't believe that I would voluntarily spend weeks and weeks and weeks interviewing people. But that is the most amazing experience where we get to learn from all of the people that are interested in our program in terms of what their journey, their development journey as a, as a manager was, starting off as a junior, developing and improving themselves. And through that process, we um, want to see whether you are going to be able to contribute to those productive discussions in class. Because the students that we admit into the program, we want you to get the full value. And by getting the full value, we mean having fruitful discussions with others in class as well. So um, the typical questions we ask uh, is not anything that has right or wrong answers. It's typically, give me an example from your experience. And I think that's why it energizes me so much because I get to learn so much about what people are doing in South Africa and the amazing ways in which they are changing their organizations and the country. So there are four of us that you will get to know immediately. And the rest I will introduce to you in January once you come to our um, summer school. But the four people that you will have the most um, contact with during this initial period is myself, Krishna, Alma, and Loret. And you get to meet them next door as well. Um, they are super competent um, and they are in most cases more informed about what's going on than I am. So um, I enjoy working with the three of them, but if you get a, an email from us or you inquire with us, it is just important to know what the people look like that you will be engaging with. So that's what I wanted to say in terms of the MBA. One of the big questions that people mostly ask that we don't publish as obviously on the um, website, that is, apart from what it means in terms of, of coming to class, is what does an MBA with the Northwest University typically cost? And the reason why we don't publish that is because that will depend on which subjects you take. So I can give you a ballpark figure of it's roughly um, 240,000 rand for the two-year qualification. So that divided over two years. But every subject has a specific amount linked to that. Um, apart from that cost, um, there's a fee that is, uh, no, as part of that cost is the fee that is needed for your two um, study schools. So that fee is already included in there. But then we also offer an optional international tour in the second year of the MBA. It is linked to the, the module that I present, um, international business issues, but it is not compulsory to take to go on the tour to take the subject or to take the subject to go on the tour because international business issues is currently a, a, um, an optional subject. So you can choose between entrepreneurship and international business issues. But every year in the second year, we offer that opportunity to our students. In the links that you will receive, um, you will also see a, a short video of this year's tour when we visited Berlin. Next year's MBA tour for the second years will travel to New York. So every year we will um, be going somewhere else. It keeps things exciting, but it is definitely every time something that is completely different to the typical experience that you would get in Africa. Um, but that comes at an additional cost. And that would, of course, then depend on where we're traveling, what the cost would be. So um, I think that should answer most of the cost questions that you might have. So those are the typical questions that I think uh, most of you wanted answered on the MBA. I'm going to hand over to Johan now, so he can start um, traveling to the front in terms of the um, PGDM program. But the most important thing that you need to take cognizance of is that we have two weeks of application window left. 
So that is why we hosted the, the open day now, is that those of you that were still wondering, you still have two weeks to apply, and then we will give you an additional two weeks to submit any incomplete documentation. So if there's maybe a copy of a qualification that you obtained previously that you don't immediately have access to, or you don't have a certified student record or something like that, you can still complete your file after that. But if you are interested, please apply by the 31st of October. Okay, so Yuan, it's your turn. Hello, everybody. I'm Johan Jordan. Who admits the people? Am I supposed to? You can. We take turns. <laughs> okay, I'm Johan Jordan. I'm program leader of the postgraduate diploma in management. Uh, the official acronym is PGDM, but we, we, we find it easier to talk about the PGDIP. It's the same thing. Right, so um, in terms of the PGDM, what it is, it's basically an uh, honest level qualification that teach you basic management skills. Now, after Lienta has spoken about the MBA, the question often arises, but what's the difference between the two? The MBA focus more on strategic level. We do the functional stuff, operations, finance, et cetera, but it's more about the application of the theory and on, on a strategic master's level. Whereas the postgraduate diploma in management uh, focus on, on more on the detail. As an example, I'm teaching operations management. Operations in MBA, you apply it in your own business, in your own workplace. Operations, in on PG Dip, we teach you how to calculate productivity, et cetera. Right, so, so, so that's the difference between the two. It's basically a general management qualification, and it caters for, for two kinds of, I almost said animals, of, of candidates. <laughs> the, 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 one the one type of candidate is we have a full-time program, which is for undergrad students, and we'll have their open day next week, who's, who know they study pharmacy and they want to stay another year on university at university because they on the SRC or something, and they realize that sometime in their future they need to manage a pharmacy. So they need to manage the inventory in the pharmacy. They need to hire and fire people. They need to motivate the employees. So they need these basic management skills. That's the one population for whom we're catering. The other one, and that's where most of you probably fit in, are the, the, the full or the part-time and the distance offering where we take working people and people who work uh, usually have acquired a lot of these skills in the workplace. I mean, you understand politics and you understand the, 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 the management issues in the workplace, but you need a formal qualification to go along with that. You need the papers, right? And that's where the PGDM comes from. Now, okay, to, let's admit, um, the entry qualification is, one of two. One is, and, the, and, the, and it's basically the uh, a caters for the full-time student. You need a bachelor's qualification, bachelor's degree with minimum of 60% in your final year. You don't need experience. If you have experience, you only need a bachelor's degree with two years management experience or, or, or relevant work experience. Um, so either one of those, and if you still don't qualify, we also have people that we accept on RPL, that means recognition of prior learning. And often those are uh, those of you are people who didn't have the opportunity to do some undergrad studies. You, you didn't have the opportunity to go and, 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 and go to university, whatever, but you've worked your way up through the ranks. So for in that case, you need to supply proof that you can operate on an honest level, that you can actually do this course. Um, further to what, what Lungi says, we take quality very serious. We don't want to give you a qualification which is worth as, as much or as little as a matric certificate. Right, so, and therefore, we do some screening, we do have a selection process, 
And that's why we have these entry requirements. And that's why if you don't have the, the, the formal papers, you need to prove to us that you can actually operate on this level. I honestly believe if you're clever enough to get into the program, you, if you're clever enough to work, get through the program, you just have to do the work. Right. Uh, one question that often comes is, what's the difference between application and registration? Application is to get you into the program. Registration is to get you formally part of the, uh, of the student body. Right, so application for PGDIP, you can, you can apply until the 30th of November. Our RPL applications have already closed. Um, you can apply for RPL for 2024. And the registration opens on the 8th of January, and that's because the university's books open on, the, on that day. Right, then the delivery modes, and I think I need to explain a bit this. We, we have three different delivery modes. On the right hand is a distance class. The distance class is pretty much what Leonta exp exp explained, where you have a series of videos where all the content is, is explained, you do your assignments, etc., and you can view these videos whenever you want. You have some question and answer sessions, but we don't require you to sit in a synchronous lesson where everybody sits at the same time. In other words, if you don't want to attend your question and answer session, it's up to you. Right, own time, own, pro, own, own pace. The part-time students is we will have classes during, sat, uh, during Saturdays. We have a, a, a study, some study schools where we actually want to engage with you face-to-face, -face, but we also have online backup. We, we know there are some people who can't be here or in Mafike or in Val on every second Saturday um, because they live too far from here. So we have online backup, so you can follow the lessons online, but that is essentially a contact mode. We want to engage with you. We want to have group discussions in class and et cetera. And then we've got the full-time students, and those are the people coming from undergrad. Their classes are during the week on campus, similar to any undergrad program. All right. So please understand the distinctions between part-time and distance mode. Part-time, we want to see you in class. Right. Whether it's online, whether it's face-to-face. -face. Distance mode is you get the content, and you, you can do it at your own time. Somebody all, all the time switch off my camera. Right, assessments, um, yet again, quality is very important. And the COVID era actually uh, moved us from normal sit-down exams. So in, in all your assessments, are <coughs> there is a lot of group work as well. Group assignments, individual assignments, and then final portfolios or exams in the end. And the reason why we focus on group work, and I think that's an important question to answer. Why do we sit in these horrible study groups? Because there's always somebody not pulling their weight. I, I don't know who of you have experienced that. It's Remember, study is a, is, is a kind of a microcosm of the whole world. The working place works the same. You work in teams and there are always people doing nothing and other people doing everything. Right. While you are at that point, there's a question that is relevant now. I'm listening. Um, they would like to know if you're enrolled for one of each month, are you allowed to attend the sessions <coughs> the yeah, this is governed by the the, the, the Oh, okay, I'll get to that question in a second. Um, the idea about group work, when I was a student, I always thought it was about getting the lecturer less marking. That's not what it's about. The, 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 the rules have changed. 20 years ago, an MBA and a PG dip was about the knowledge. The knowledge is out there on the internet. We just need to, lead, to, to, to teach you quality control. We need to, need to teach you to distinguish between what is news and what is fake news. Right. The, the changing world, when people hire somebody with a qualification, they hire somebody who can make decisions, who can communicate, who can solve problems, 
who can manage conflict, etc. And those skills you grow in your study group. That's why we focus on group work as well. It teaches you all these soft skills that will actually get you promoted. The paper that you receive afterwards is not going to get you promoted. Your skill set will get you promoted afterwards. Right. Um, the question, what's the question again? <laughs> Right, uh, the, we are governed by HEQC, the Higher Education Quality Council, in terms of what you can do. Part-time students and full-time students, contact students, can get access to the videos of distance students, not the other way around. There will be certain sessions where we, we accommodate everybody, it's typically a question and answer session, where we accommodate some uh, everybody at the same time, but you, uh, distance students have access to the distance material and that's it. And that's based on the rules of the government. It, 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 it's not our limitations. Right. Also switching between modes, you can switch from contact to distance, but you cannot switch from distance to contact. Very difficult. It needs to be signed up by the registrar. It, it's a huge paper process, a bureaucracy of note. Right. Then what I've basically said to you, and, and there, there's, uh, we'll send each of you this infographic, which is basically a summary of what I've just said to you. With that, I want to say, I think postgraduate diploma in management is a wonderful qualification. If I had the opportunity to do this qualification earlier in my career, I would have been far further in my career than I am now. Um, <laughs> right, so, so welcome. The, the, some, I see some of the PG Dip students are here probably going on to MBA, and you'll probably attest to that. It's, it, it's really a valuable qualification. I wish to welcome all of you. Right, question. Fee structure is, okay, the fee structure differs from for distance and contact students. For contact students, uh, it will... It's about 40, 45,000 Rand a year. Yeah, next year it's going to go up. Inflation. Right, so it's, it's, it's in the vicinity of 40 odd thousand Rand for the year, spread evenly over the two semesters. So you've got five modules, five subjects per semester. In the first semester, you've got five core subjects. In other words, everybody take them. In the second semester, you've got five subjects, of which two are electives. In other words, there are five, there are three core subjects, and the other two, you can choose any two or five subjects. And each of those modules costs the same. They all cost exactly the same. So it's basically, a, it's around 40 to 45,000 Rand for the year. So that's a cheap course. If you haven't got money, you do this one. Right. <laughs> Yes. Yes. If the question is, if you're busy with a short course at the Northwest University, can you enroll for a for a uh, for the PG dip? Yes, you can. Um, the, the the one thing that you need to learn is to manage your time, and 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 you'll see that PG dip is you've got five subjects per semester. So if you do the part time or distance, you can do it over two years. If you're very busy, I suggest you do that. Um, you can also do it in one year, and it's very hectic. So in terms of time management, just take note that that's the one skill you will learn. Sorry, you, Lungi. <laughs> very important. Remember what Lenta said, or actually what Lungi said, to get into an MBA level, one of the qualifications, you, uh, one of the requirements is you need an NQF level eight qualification, either an honors degree or a four year degree or a postgraduate diploma. The PG DIP is not an automatic transition into MBA. It just ticks that box that you have an NQF eight qualification. You still need to go through the other entry requirements as well, right? It's not an automatic. Okay, I'm in the I'm in this on this railway now and the train is going. 
you still have to tick the other boxes as well. Thank you very much, Lungi. Any other questions? Nothing. Yes. Uh, up to now, there was. I, 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 let me tell you the history. The history is when we started the PG that we didn't know whether we we're going to fill the program. So we, we, we basically had three subjects that you, if you've done them, you can get credit for them on MBA. Right. This year that's coming, 2023, is the last year that you can get credit for PG dip subjects on MBA. For two subjects, which is corporate governance and what's the other one? Uh, talent management, strategic talent management. So if you've just, if you're busy completing your PG dip now, you can get credit for them on MBA level for next year. But in 2024, those of you entering PG dip now, those are uh, non, none of the accreditation bodies like that. So that's being phased out. If you get into MBA for 2024, there will be no credits. Right. No more questions? Then I give the floor. Cost of distance, Cost of distance is about 75% of the, uh, the it's about 30,000. So it's, it's slightly cheaper. Admit. Okay. No more questions? Then I give the floor to my learned colleague, Prof. Lekundu. Yes, Prof. Joe. Thank you, Yuan. And um, he forgot to introduce his awesome team and himself. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see the slide. All right. So um, we also have a very, a very competent PGDM um, admissions and admi administration team. So for those of you that have asked online whether there is, um, well, you heard that our applications at the university have closed for the year and postgraduate diploma is one of them. That's not true. Um, so maybe the person that responded to that may have um, responded incorrectly. So we will assist. Um, please use the contact details on our website for any of these um, five very competent people, and we will assist you with the administrative process for um, specifically the PGDM. Please contact the MBA team for MBA inquiries. Yes, sir. Can you quickly wait because the people online won't be able to hear you. <laughs> Not as gracefully as I planned. <laughs> yeah, uh, good, 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 good morning again, 10 minutes before afternoon. Silungil, I'm having a question for you. I hope you had the earlier part of what I said. There are people who uh, achieved or obtained a master's a long time back, right? Now, when, when I look at the, the curriculum for the MBA, I can see that one would have done courses there. I just need to check as to the maximum number of courses uh, from which one could be exempted. Uh, coming from the masters in governments uh, that are featuring in the MBA curriculum. You get what I'm trying to say? Maximum, I only need the maximum of them. Okay. Uh, 
under, under the new revised uh, MBA curriculum, we no longer do module exemptions, unless, especially from the PGDM program to the MBA. Unless if you have completed that qualification previously, remember now the MBA, for example, is an NQF level nine, it's a master's degree. Unless if you come to us and say, within the past five years, I was studying this master's degree, let's say, for example, from UNISA, and I did this module of corporate governance, for example, which is also presented here in the MBA that you want to enroll for with us. Then we will take that module and compare with what we offer and compare the assessment method and the outcomes and everything. If the, an expert in that module deem it fit or suitable to grant an exemption, that is the only way to be exempted. So it's still another process that your qualification from another qualification or institution needs to be evaluated for you to be granted that. It's not automatic or it's not guaranteed still. Thanks for that. My question is, my question is, it's, but, not, it's still not automatic, say. Oh, it's still it's not, still not automatic. automatic. Yeah. You still need to follow the proper procedure in applying for module exemption. But remember, it's not automatic. It can still be declined based on various reasons, which you will be explained uh, when we communicate back to you on that. Okay, let me just put it somewhat uh, practically. Mm -hmm. Because I know that in the past, you would just apply and they'll check. Obviously, they'll find out that he did this module and did this module and did this module that we are offering. It will be up to them to say, we give them exemption here, exemption here, exemption here. In other words, you don't need to, to apply, apply specifically. No, it, it's no longer like that, say. Okay. It's no longer like that. You Things have, have changed. Apply. Remember I said we are evolving and we need to ensure that our quality systems are forever tight, you know, that, we need to what, comply. That, so I'm some asking. of the things are, are changed completely. It's no longer the same as previously. Previously, yes, it was automatic because we knew that there were three credit bearing modules from the PGDM to the MBA okay. program, yeah. But now you have to do a, a formal proper no, I'm, uh, application. I'm, I'm, I'm Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, um, I'm Joseph Lekunze. Uh, I'm speaking uh, about the MBA and PhD research journey in my capacity as the school research chair. Yeah, before I commence, it is important for you, for me to highlight that uh, I think uh, uh, Prof. Lenta has talked much about the MBA program because she's the program manager. I'm going to focus uh, between the two programs, that's MBA and PhD, there's a research component. And I know most students are aware about the research component being one of the key aspects that delay students in terms of their graduation. So basically, I, I am involved both in MBA, that research aspect, and in PhD. So my discussion with you this morning is try to, is, is to uh, try to uh, highlight you about some of the challenges, some of the difficulties with regard to research. Because what I've noticed over the years is that MBA mini dissertation has been one of the major stumbling blocks for students completing their studies. It has been a major challenge. And uh, the research office has a full team that is working uh, uh, on research. And in that team, we have a research manager, I think Christine Brokos, who is sitting at the back there, she's the manager. Uh, we have administrators, about three of them. We have uh, Teboko Tebejani, we have Christine Monroe, who is focusing on ethics, and then we have Sophie Mogorosi. It's quite a, a, a massive office because the workload there is quite huge and the strategic importance of the office. Now, before I commence, uh, usually during the MBA research days, we usually have two MBA, I think four in, in, in your journey. Uh, in the beginning of your program, that is phase one, around June, we have what we call the MBA research day. But before I talk about the MBA research day, it's also important for me to distinguish between the research methodology module, which is a module that have a lecturer who lectures that particular module. And at the end of that particular module, you are, uh, you are awarded a mark. And that module is 12 credit. 
we have the research uh, 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 thesis or research project, which is the mini dissertation. It has 54 credit. It's a 54 credit bearing module. And during in with our phase one student at the beginning of uh, uh, during your first year in June, all the students are allocated a promoter. And I'm sure those of you who are present who are currently uh, 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 enrolled for the MBA program, you do have a promoter. But the end, the mini dissertation is a second year uh, 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 module. It's a year module uh, and it's a second year module. So your work with your promoter normally kicks in in January of your second year. That's when your work kicks in. But usually we encourage students to start interact with their promoters as early as possible before you start the program, before the actual uh, work commence in January. Why do I say that? Uh, there, 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 there are several committees that you need to go through. In uh, those committees are responsible for quality assurance of your dissertation. Secondly, uh, your, uh, a part of that, there's the ethics process, which usually is challenging for students. Some students take three months, other takes four. Some will even take even a year trying to acquire ethics. So in this, in, in, in this slide today, I'm going to try to explain certain things to you. Uh, the beginning of research in our school begins with what we call the research committees, the scientific committees. Uh, remember, the MBA is like a, a broad church where we have students from different backgrounds, different enterprises coming together. So what we have done in the school is to try as much as possible to group the, the, the students into to focus areas. And based on that, we have three focus areas. We have three focus scientific committees, which are the general management scientific committees. We have the people's management scientific committee. We have the corporate governance, technology, economics, and finance scientific committees. Now, once you are allocated a supervisor, you have to work with your supervisor. Once your supervisor agreed or is satisfied that your proposal is ready, they have to submit to one of these scientific committees. That is the first stage. The committee sits once every month. These three committees, it sits once every month. In this committee, your proposals will be reviewed for the quality and if the quality is of standard, the proposal will be, uh, uh, will be sent to the ethics committee of the faculty for it to be processed for your ethics number. So that is one hurdle. And students face a lot of challenge with this. And it is very, very important for you to start your, your, your interaction with your supervisor as early as possible to ensure that uh, uh, you, you get through this process, maybe by March or April that we, we do good for you. Uh, once the proposal is approved, it goes to the scientific committee, uh, to the faculty ethics committee firms. And there, if they are satisfied with your proposal and the quality and everything there, and the risk level of your ethics application, you will be issued with the ethics number. Students are not allowed to collect data without their work ethically being approved. Your work must be approved by the ethics committee. Without an ethics number, you are not allowed to continue with your mini dissertation to collect data. So that is, that is very clear. So that is one of the challenge I just want to inform you about. The office is also responsible for, the, for everything about research in terms of the interaction, the challenges that you have with your supervisor and all the other things. The office will, will further be involved with you until when you submit your mini dissertation. The title registration form and all the other requirements, you have to submit those forms. And the office has to take those forms through the various committees of the faculty for approvals. That is very, very important. So I'm not saying that research is, 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 is not possible for you to, to complete your mini dissertation within the specified time. I am just saying that you have to be focused. You have to commit yourself to in doing the work. Research is not like any other module. It's quite an intensive work a, a module, a, especially mini dissertation. And you have to put in a lot of effort. You have to burn a lot of candles for you to succeed at the end of the day. We have students that have stayed in the program for every five years, getting to six years, just because of that particular module 
they are terminated. They can't complete the, 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 the program. So please, you have to be caution about that. So we have talked about the scientific committees and, and, and the ethical clearance process. Uh, 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 we have talked about the, the scientific committees and the ethical processes that you have to follow. Uh, uh, also in terms of PhD, Now, the next program that the research office is responsible for is the PhD. They are basically responsible from applications, admissions, uh, colloquiums, where they propose. We have three colloquiums, which is like defense. We have the proposal stage where the student they defend their proposal. We have methodology, and we have the results and finding before it is submitted to higher degrees for, 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 uh, for external examination. So the research office. I'm just limiting it here, but it is quite a massive process. All these processes, they are very tedious and it involves a lot of paperwork and quality assurance. And the Northwest University Business School, we, we have to report to the faculty. So in all the faculties committee, for example, the higher degrees committee of the faculty, the examination committee of the faculty, and all the quality assurance committee of the faculty, we have to de defend each and every student's report or your reports from external examiners, we have to defend them in that committee before you graduate. So we are at the tail end of your program. Uh, we are the first people in the research office. The day we get into that meeting and defend your reports or your results, once it is approved in that meeting, it means you have completed your program. So we are the people who, at the end of the day, we are at the tail end where we determine, uh, not we determine, where we ensure that uh, uh, all your all the necessary compliance has been made, and you now qualified, or you are you, you now qualified to be awarded an MBA degree or a PhD degree. So the final form for that that final template for it to be captured on your transcript usually is signed by me. Once that your marks have been presented and everything has been checked for quality by Christine, so we are always at the background that those work are being done to us. So uh, by us. So furthermore, there are other activities that we do in the office, operations, complaints, student complaints, extension of studies. If you want to extend your study, especially when it concerns uh, uh, extension of studies, all those uh, activities are handled in our office. So if you have any issues regarding research, you, you, you either send your complaint through to Christine Broncos, or to the administrators. And I, I think they are, they are, uh, we are going to display those administrators so you can put the, the, name, the face to the names. So I want to thank you. If there are any questions or comments, I, I'm ready to take them for now. You are welcome to ask some questions. Yes. Now I'm listening. Yeah, I think, yeah. 
No, thank you for that question. I think we have been having uh, some of those requests. Uh, but remember, uh, uh, programs are being reviewed over the years. As time passes, programs are being reviewed. New content, which the, the programs are being restructured, the admissions requirement keeps on changing depending on, on the particular period in time. And this is to ensure quality. And remember, like our accreditation manager said, our programs are constantly being reviewed, uh, recommendations are made, and it is our responsibility to strengthen those programs and get them approved by CHE and all the other accredited bodies. Now, currently, uh, uh, I know in the past, uh, those who had did MBA about 20 years ago, that particular research mini dissertation component was not part of it. But uh, we believe, I always advise the student, uh, those who want to do PhD, it is advisable for you to do a short course. Different universities, they have something like a bridging course, which is a research, a research module or research. I know they have one in Stalinburg. I'm not sure about Northwest University, but I believe within Northwest University, maybe within the School of uh, uh, Economics and Management Sciences, there's such course. So if you can show proof that you have taken such course, uh, uh, you have taken such course uh, uh, within, uh, you have taken such course, then we can, it can form part of your application and uh, you will be given the opportunity. Because I must tell you in terms of PhD, we have huge, uh, 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 the public have huge appetite for our PhD program. Our PhD program is a part-time program. It's a four year cycle program. It's a full research program. It's a full research program, and the minimum cutoff point for you to qualify is 65% and above uh, for your overall mark and the mini dissertation or the research, that particular dissertation module. So it's two things there. But as I said, for those who had qualification long time ago, there's an opportunity for you to do a bridging course. Maybe with that, if you include a certificate that you completed that course, we can consider you and invite you for the selection process. Uh, for now, within the business school, we haven't developed such a course. Uh, yeah. There's a question from the internet asking, what's the cost of the PhD qualification? Yeah, no thanks. PhD qualification is one of the cheapest qualification. It's the highest, but the cheapest. Currently, it's about 21,000 per year. PhD is, uh, like I said, is currently our PhD, and our PhD is PhD in economics and management sciences with a focus on business administration. So our, we offer, the PhD that we offer is in business administ uh, administration. There it is, Mr. Sir. And to further add to your question, remember, even the, the, the standard, the qualification, their structure has changed. In the past, I think masters used to be NQF level, is it seven or eight? Yes. But current eight, currently is NQF level nine. Then PhD used to be NQF level nine, currently is NQF level 10. So for you to qualify to do a, a, an NQF level 10 program, you need to be at the level of NQF level nine. Therefore, if your qualification was NQF level eight, there's a need for something like that bridging, this thing that I'm talking about, which we add more weight to your application and you will be invited. Uh, but our application, our admission into our PhD program also is not direct because we have a lot of interest. Usually uh, in the past three or four years, we have been having approximately 150, between 100 and 150 applicants a year. And we have capacity for only between 10 to 17 or 20 maximum a year. So not everybody who even meet the requirement and qualifies for the program gets direct admissions. What we do, we organize a PhD selection workshop where each and every applicant is given an opportunity to sit with the, the members of all the academics, both internal and external academics, and present your proposal and your, your case, your research case to them. And finally, a decision will be made, the best candidate will be accepted into the program. And even when you are accepted, we don't give you direct admission. We conditionally accept you in the program. And then we give you six months 
within that six months, you must present a full, a full proposal in a PhD colloquium organized. It's only after that proposal uh, is approved and you are doing well, that is when we convert your admission from being, on condi uh, 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 from being conditional ad admissions to unconditional admission and you become a full-time student. So it's quite a rigorous process here. More questions? Yes. In, in terms of PhD, I know the university has a bursary uh, uh, that every student, and, and that is centrally controlled. So you have to apply from the university central office. But as a school, we don't offer bursary but the bursary for the university is centrally managed and there's an office. If you need a bursary, every PhD student, once you, you have been accepted into the program, you can apply. Usually I know the bursary is different between from full-time to part-time. And remember our program is a part-time program. So if for full-time the bursary, let me say is 20 grand, for part-time student, you will get only 10 grand. So, so that's the uni that's that's the best that's that's the much I know about it. But it's, it's centrally managed. Any more questions? Yeah. So so the, the team that was put up there, as you are beginning the journey with your supervisors, any challenge that you have, that lady behind the Christine uh, Brokers, you must send her an email as long as it concerns research, not about different, if there are, if it concerns different module, you can talk to Prof Lenta, but once it concerns research, uh, uh, the work, workings between you and your supervisor, whether you have been allocated a supervisor, title registration, you will see forms coming from them, ethics issue, you direct all those issues, any challenges related to research, that is the office, and those are the administrators who are responsible for that. Send a message, a message to them, and you will get an answer. Thank you very much. Okay, I hope you have some, some energy left, but luckily our next speaker is very energetic. Um, I think one thing that we maybe haven't mentioned is that the PhD applications is still open until the 31st of January. So that is um, something to keep in mind, especially since we want to um, admit people that have completed their uh, master's degree. So we need to wait for those results as well. Okay, Murnay, please um, take the almost graveyard shift. Yeah. Good day, everyone. I'm last, but I'm so happy about that. Um, I'm Mornay van der Berg. I'm the manager of executive education of the Northwest University's business school. Now, you've heard everything about the postgraduate diploma. You've heard how you've grown to become an MBA master. Now, you've also heard how you became an academic animal, you know, being a PhD student. And then what then? That's why I'm lost. All right. So, you become a manager. You realize, but you, you require something, your skills are becoming outdated, or you've got uh, staff members under your control that you feel, but they're really not up there the way they should be. Why? Because we change, life change. We had COVID. Um, I think COVID was the biggest accelerator for change, especially using technology and so forth. And you know, there are a lot of people out there that did not keep up with the change. All right, so that's where executive education comes in. Um, I'm going to show you a little intro about the executive education. Fast changing South Africa. It is imperative. You've seen this video, video just now, and you know when we started with the presentation. I just want to refresh your minds about executive education. Otherwise, we can skip this one. We played. In a fast-changing South Africa, it is imperative that managers equip themselves with cutting-edge knowledge and skills, especially insights regarding the latest developments in the business environment. 
The challenge is developing skills and obtaining the knowledge to convert obstacles into opportunities, creating value for companies and the country. The Northwest University Business School has special expertise in the field of management. Our executive education programs and short courses are designed to empower emerging managers with a solid foundation of business skills and knowledge to fully develop their intellectual capability. Qualify yourself for further promotion and supercharge your career with any of the following Northwest University Business School courses. Project Management and Advanced Project Management. Fundamental Management, Middle Management and the Advanced Short Learning Program on Management Strategy. So, whether you are a team leader, supervisor, frontline manager or perhaps a promising individual for entry into a management position, make sure you apply for our Executive Education Short Learning Programs. Northwest University Business School, shaping executive minds in Africa. Thank you, that's Murphy's Law. The video was perfect this morning, it was perfect yesterday, it was perfect the day before. Now this morning when we need to show it to you, it's a bit jaggery, but that's life. All right, so the Executive Education Department, we mainly focus on flagship programs, managerial programs and skills development programs. Now I'm quickly going to show you um, uh, a, a few of our programs. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just going to give you the background pertaining to that. And then I also will introduce you to the forensic courses and then the Small Business Advisory Bureau as well. All right, so our first program that we have as a managerial program of the flagship programs, it's the Fundamental Management Program. So this is basically for your upcoming supervisors um, or people that you earmark to becoming better managers within your company. So this is the entry level. That's a young person uh, who wants to grow to become a manager. And then we just uh, uh, acquaint them with the principles of management. So there are only four modules um, of which you can see it on the screen there. And this specific program is only six months. All right, it's only six months and there are two study schools um, and, and I'm not going to go into the detail, but after the fundamental management program, we have the middle management program. So in order to qualify for the middle management program, you need to already have something like the fundamental management program, or at least be in a position where you'll be able to enroll for the middle management program, uh, preferably being on a middle management level or have a few years of work experience. Usually when people are within their 20s, late 20s, we, we will look at the admission and they don't have to do the fundamental because as you go along within the working place, you pick up the fundamentals of management. So you will be able to enroll directly for the middle management if you're a little bit on, bit on the older side. Okay, not really that old. After the middle management program, we call this, it's the advanced management program. It in fact has a very fancy name. Uh, let me just put that there. It's called the Advanced Short Learning Program on Management Strategy. The reason why I want to show you the wording of management strategy, with the fundamental management, you, you learn the basics of management. With the middle management, we show you the, 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 the functional side of management. What is marketing? What is economics? What is your technological uh, behavior? What is your operations management and so forth? But now you've got the functionals, you know now the how, what then? It's how you apply the how to be better than your competitor. That's why you need to apply your strategy and being a better competitor. Hence, this is the advanced management program. It's usually for your area managers, your directors, and so forth. Um, so yeah, this is also, once again, uh, this is a 10th, 10 month program. It's in fact 12 months, but we allow for redo of examinations. Um, people do fall ill, especially now with the COVID we had quite you know, people were seriously ill and aware to accommodate them. So yeah, it's basically a 10 month program and it can escalate about to 10 months, uh, 12 months. All right, then we've got the skills development programs. For instance, the project management. Now, I usually say so when I appoint people, I look on their CVs to see whether project management has been, uh, uh, it's, it's part of the portfolio for the simple reason if someone does project management, you know, he's a planner, you know, he can uh, do cost procurement, uh, cost management, he's able to, to value time, he's able to, to allocate stuff. 
Um, so project management is your functional um, uh, a short course. And it's not about building bridges. It's not about building roads. Every day is a project. This whole thing today was a project. You being here was a project. All right, so this morning you, you, you're you laughing now. So I, I think there's something that happened that what didn't go quite according to plan this morning then. So that's part of the risk of project management and how you're going to deal with it. All right, so after the project management, then you'll be able to do the advanced project management. The simple difference is the one is more, more focused on managerial reporting of uh, how the project is going. It's your compilation of your project reporting and so forth. All right, so I'm going to move now to another functional um, short course. Now that's the emotion, intelligence, conflict, and stress management. It's a very, very short, short course. It's only two days. Then you've got a portfolio of evidence that you need to complete within six days. Now, this emotion intelligence is not about how you uh, apply yourself at work, but you also take this with your private life. Um, what I've learned about this program is when I go home and there's a taxi or someone not allowing my first ride of, of driving, why be, why be mad? Why kick the dog and pull the cat's ears? Because tomorrow is going to do the same. All right, so that's the emotional intelligence and conflict management. It's part of the plethora of the programs that we do have. Then I'm quickly going to go to the forensic courses. I'm not going to go into detail, but we also... Did I do something wrong here? Screen sharing paused. Can you fix that from your side? Sorry. I was just clicking there. Thank you. All right, so the forensic courses, um, they, it's for the commercial forensic investigations. It's uh, forensic accounting, commercial uh, forensic law, forensic information technology, um, practice in fraud and risk management. Um, as you have heard that the university of, uh, well, the business school, we also focus on, on corruption and integrity studies and so forth. So we've, we really do put a high price on and on commercial investigation, you know, looking at crime. And this is part of the short courses that will help you, uh, you know, looking at the forensics of what's going on within a business, um, whether it's via the technological, uh, technological use of computers and frameworks and uh, social media and so forth. So let me just continue to another section. Seems like the computer has frozen. Let's try there. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail, but I've mentioned to you the courses that are available there for forensic accounting. Then we've got the Small Business Advisory Bureau. Now that is mainly focused on entrepreneurship, your small businesses, your SMEs, and so forth, upcoming businesses. There are three programs of which the first one is the business management and entrepreneurship. And then, of course, we have our small business consultancy short courses. All right, so why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do these short courses? You want to make yourself promotable or you feel like you do have a business degree? Why do you want to do this? But you feel there's something lacking. Like I've explained just now, life changes. You need to be uh, on standard of what's going on. So these short courses have been developed in order to equip you, being a better manager, being a better employee, being a better version of yourself. Just now we had the question about, you know, if you do a short course, we'll be able to enroll for, for the formal qualifications. If you complete the fundamental management program, the middle management and advanced management program, you can actually apply for RPL. But there are conditions, um, with all admission requirements, there are conditions. You need to complete your, your fundamental, your middle, and your advanced management on at least 60% of an average. Then, of course, there will be the interviews uh, uh, and admission requirements being looked at um, uh, for you to enroll for your postgraduate diploma and eventually your MBA as well. All right, this is the team. And in the meanwhile, the team has grown. Uh, Safi Molefe has been added to my team. She's a cotton wool lady. 
very competent and uh, unfortunately I don't have a photo of her yeah we still but she is very very crispy she's still very very new so at the end of the day yeah we don't have her yet at this stage so uh, thank you very much okay thank you for everyone that stuck around I can imagine that you're quite hungry now so luckily we were, are a, about to feed you but if there are any questions that you still that still left unanswered, you're welcome to ask them now. Well, we have one right here. Yeah, Hello. Where's our other mic, please? Thank you, Jason. You're not supposed to hear it's for online. So, <laughs> so if it's switched on, it will work. Mental as well as the strategy process. What NQ level they are falling in? Can you that to us, please? All right, I'll explain it to you. Um, the CHE requires universities not to mention NQF levels for non-formal programs. So we are actually forbidden to refer to NQF levels. But the FMP is on a proposed NQF level 5, the middle management on a proposed NQF level 6, and the advanced management on a proposed NQF level 7. So if you look at that, any B degree starts with an NQF 5, your first year, your second year is a 6, and your third year is a seven. So that's why we say if you completed the FMP, the MMP and the AMP, you actually have, you know, you've got the fifth, your first year, your second and your third year, but you do require some credits in order to um, uh, 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 qualify for formal qualification. Now, where do, you credit, where do you get the credits from? Now, that's where we look at your CV. We look at your managerial experience. We look at your working experience, and that will add up to the notional hours that we use in the short courses for you to gain entry to a postgraduate diploma, for instance, as an RPL. Does that answer your question? My pleasure. Okay, while she is getting ready, one of the questions that we received online is, what does assessments look like in an MBA context? And I can assure you that it is um, applied. So there's, it's a, it's a postgraduate exam or a postgraduate qualification. Hence, you don't have the typical undergraduate go and study for a test and come and write a test. Environment, you have applied either examinations, open book examinations, or portfolios of evidence, and that will depend from uh, subject to subject how that will be implemented. So just to answer that online question, please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you so much to the business. Um, in terms of the application process, when are the close? Very good question. The fundamental management program has two intakes. Uh, it's one around about March and another one in July. Because it's a six month course, there are two intakes. The middle management is around February when it starts. And because it's a year, um, there are not another intake because the modules are not split. For instance, like that you can take four modules in, in the one semester and then new modules in the second semester so that you could start with the second intake. Unfortunately, uh, we had to change these as well because previously they were 118, not allowed to say credits, and it had to be brought down to, to 60 according to regulation from, from uh, CHE and SACWI and so forth. So that actually forced us to have some of the modules that you commence in the first semester, uh, continuing the second semester. So to answer you, there are only one intake. But if it's companies that want a company-specific intake, any time of the year, and we will accommodate scheduling for the companies um, for them. It's the same with the advanced management program. 
Um, for the skills development programs, we've got different intakes. Project management, for instance, we've got four to five intakes, and depending on how full the classes are. If the classes are very full and we've reached critical mass, around about 25 to 30 per intake, we will schedule another intake. So we, we take it as is during the year, and then we'll, we will react to the volumes. And it's the same with all the other uh, uh, skills development courses. Depending on the enrollment volumes, we will schedule you know, another intake if necessary. Does it answer your question? All right, thank you very much. I oh, yeah, the how much part. It differs. Um, I'm gonna shoot from the hip. Uh, the project management is currently 8,500, but it depends whether it's going to be online or within contact, because if it's a contact session, we make provision for catering, um, and, and of course we have to hire venues in some instances and so forth, so hence that will be a little bit more expensive. The fundamental management program, um, gosh, now I'm stuck all of a sudden. Um, I think it's about 18,000, I might be wrong now. Then we've got the middle management program. Let's say it's around about 28. I'm just taking ballpark figures now. And then, then we've got the advanced management program around about 32,000 rand. Now we already had a question this morning, but why is it so expensive if you can compare it to a PG debt that is perhaps for instance, in some instances or postgraduate diploma on any degree is about 29,000 rand. This is all inclusive. You, the, when you, the amount you see is the amount you pay because this entails your books, your textbooks for each and every module. It entails registration, it entails your application, and if it's uh, via contact, it's your catering and everything is included. So if you compare it to other business schools, we've done the comparison before, we are still cheaper than most of the business schools. So for the value you're getting with this wonderful accreditation that, that you've seen now, um, this is value for money. Thank you. One more question for, from um, Zoom asking, okay, now there's many questions, but, <laughs> but one of them being, if you have an MBA, why would you continue with continuous education, specifically things like middle management or advanced management? Also another good question, you don't have to do the middle management of all the advanced management because it will be like you, you have a metric, but you're going to do standard six. So there, there's no use in doing that. But with the, with the skills development programs like the emotional intelligence, stress, conflict, project management, and so forth, you need to stay ahead. You need to be on par with the latest and, and new technologies. Um, so that's the reason why you should enroll for the skills development programs in order to, to be uh, relevant within the workplace. Are there any other questions online? There are bursaries available on the website of the university. If you go to our website, um, www.nwu.ac.za, um, study at um, the university, you will see there are bursaries uh, available. There are various for undergraduate, postgraduate, and so forth. So it is on our web. You can just go and have a look there. There are bursaries available. All right, so um, at this point in time, especially since we're getting towards the end of our application window, um, you should submit your complete document pack by the end of October. You should please pay and try and write the TTS test by the middle of November at the very latest, because we need to still interview you as well before um, the university closes in the second week of December. So that is why we are pressed for time. So if you can write the test, pay and write for the uh, pay for the test and write the test by the 14th of November, you should receive your outcome and you uh, have your interview and receive your outcome um, by the end of November. Um, I don't know how I'm going to find time to interview so many people in so little time, but it's fun as I mentioned. And then there was also a question regarding um, how long it takes to get feedback. As soon as you submit a, um, an application, typically within a, if it is a complete document pack, you should receive communication from us on the, the test and stuff like that. If you pass the, the first um, round of um, admission criteria, you should receive that, that feedback 
within two weeks from submitting your, your application. If the document pack is complete. If it's not complete, then it doesn't reach our our office and we can't start processing it. So it is very important to submit a complete pack. Once we have it, you get your link to pay for the test. And as soon as you submit your proof of payment, you immediately get your uh, um, link to write the test. The test typically takes you between an hour and two hours if you take rests between the different six different tests. Um, I wrote it all in one sitting personally, and it took me 45 minutes. I wouldn't recommend that, rest between it. Um, um, and then uh, you, and if you write the test and you feel bad afterwards, don't feel alone. All of us feel bad because the test is designed in such a way that there's more questions than time, so you're not supposed to finish everything. Okay, so it's, a, it's seeing how you work against the clock as well. So you write the test, we get, the, the minute that you submit that test, we immediately get your results and your report. The ne very next day, we send your development report to you and we schedule your meeting or your interview with you. Once you've had the interview, um, we add you to our list. And in exceptional circumstances where we have exceptional candidates, there was roughly about 15 so far this year, we've immediately um, inform them of it about within one day after their um, test. If they are, if you had an, an average outcome or a, a, a above average outcome, you are added to the list and you will receive your outcome by the middle of November at the very latest. Okay, so I think that answers all of um, two more questions. Okay. Will I be able to apply for MBA based on my years of work for MBA? Okay, so there's always opportunities for recognition of prior learning if you don't have a specific level of qualification, but then you need to submit a, a, a portfolio of evidence of your experience and maybe courses that you've taken. So there's no blanket answer that yes, you will be admitted, but there's a process. You apply, we consider the process through a committee, um, and you still write the exam of uh, the admission test and you still have the interview. So there are options, but preferably in QF8, please. And? I heard that you think master level, you said it's also Yes, if you wrote the test in a previous year, we will reuse it. So you, there's no reason why you need to rewrite it unless you want to improve your mark. That's the only, or your score. That's the only reason why you want, would want to rewrite the TTS test. Links to prepare, no, because you can't prepare for a test like that. Um, it is a typical aptitude test. Um, what I could um, encourage you to do is at least um, there's a, some component looking at you, apart from some aptitude kind of questions, there are um, questions that focus on your ability to extrapolate information either from a visual format, so looking at a number of um, graphs, for instance, and interpreting the results, or from a written document asking questions about what's, what the just of a, a, the minutes of a meeting, for instance, was, what was the decisions made, stuff like that. So you can't really prepare for it except for resting well and ensuring that you're not in an environment that, that you would be disturbed because I think it's in most cases, there's six tests, each of them takes roughly six to 10 minutes to complete and then you have a rest period of your choice in between. And you also don't need to complete them in, in the specific order. They do encourage you to complete it in the order, but you can complete it in any order. Mm -hmm. From today to, to Monday to pay for the, to write the test. Yeah, sure. I promise you we are busy today. So if you pay by Monday, <laughs> it's still be fine. <laughs> as far as I know, we don't charge an application fee. Um, just for the test. And the test is what a thousand, yes, a thousand two hundred rand for the test. And that is 
the exact amount that we are charged. So we don't charge on top of the service provider. We pay that fee directly to the service provider. So 1,200 rand to write the test, but no additional admin fee or application fee from the university. Everything is online. The test and the interview is conducted online. So it's not an in-person interview. And the interview typically takes about 20 minutes. In extreme circumstances where the, the candidate speaks a lot, 30 minutes. <laughs> but, but that's usually because they're so excited about their experience. Yeah. Before I ask about um, after doing engineering and coursework, can I apply for PhD? I think you can. I am unsure, and I don't see Prof. Joe here anymore, but I can't see why not. Um, I have engineering, IT, and pharmacy um, graduates that completed their master's degrees in those fields now completing a PhD with me. So I can't see, I don't think that there's any rule that you can't apply for a PhD with us. As long as the focus of the research that you want to conduct it's within our area. So you can't come and do an engineering PhD at the business school. I wish you could, because then I could supervise it with a lot more enthusiasm, or um, not necessarily enthusiasm, a lot more confidence, but you can definitely, um, with that background, still do it. All done. Uh, last one. Last one. And no one online is allowed to ask any more questions. <laughs> okay, Jason. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, he's not here, but I'm going to try and field that question. Yes. Is it possible for this question like a current situation so I can take my certificate and expand it more from the interview? I think there's definitely a possibility that, okay, do you want, do you want to answer that one? I see online questions about what reference number do you use for payments. That's all communicated in email by um, low rate. So you don't need to worry about that. That's very clearly communicated. And then a last thing, Susan, I know you feel out excluded. I miss you too today. I wish you were here. And I wish that I could feed the online crowd as well. So now please go and enjoy your time outside and next door. Remember to go and grab the booklets that I've spent so much time on preparing. Um, and then, um, yes, grab your lunch and spend some time with us and ask the questions you didn't ask yet. Thank you very much to everyone that um, joined us online as well.